It's my privilege to invite the presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eaton, to bring her report. Thank you, Carlos. Um, yeah, here we are three years later. <laughs> we do a lot in this church, all the time, everywhere, all over the place, and we do a lot of it very well. But I just wanted to recap some of the things that we've been doing the last three years. It's pretty stunning. We, uh, we uh, looked at an ecclesiology of the global church. You heard Secretary Berger talk about, thank, about that. Thanks to uh, Bishop uh, Jim Monty for cha chairing that uh, task force. Um, we started and came up with a report from the Theological Education Advisory Council, and now we're on the third iteration of the committee who is going to transform all of theological education for our entire church in about six, six, six weeks, I think we're gonna get that done, so. Um, we've had a youth gathering, we've had a, a Women of the ELCA Triennial, the Lutheran Men in Mission met together in Nashville. We have this thing, this campaign, which has been doing really wonderful work around the world. You've heard about that, and many of you have been involved in that, and I hope many more will be involved in that. Yesterday, we celebrated the wonderful fruits of the Declaration on the Way. That was, I think, for me, one of the most uh, meaningful, poignant, exciting moments um, of this assembly, certainly, but uh, I never expected that in my life, that uh, we would hear um, from Bishop Madden saying, yes, this moves us closer to Eucharistic fellowship. And for him to hold up that chalice and say, one day soon, he hoped that we would be drinking from the same cup. Was, uh, it was just a wonderful experience. We have come up with a social message on gender-based violence, which I commend to each one of you, since that is a, certainly a, um, a, an issue that is a reality for many people, not only in this church, but in this country and around the world. We are working on a social statement of women and justice. We are going to be spending some time with all of you on Called Forward Together in Christ. We had two hearings about that, but we will be speaking about that more, listening to you on, on Saturday. You heard about the Amparo um, initiative, which thank you for uh, saying yes to that. Also an important thing that we're doing as a church. Just saying, um, the Holy Family were not documented when they fled to Egypt for their lives. So something we need to keep in mind is we welcome these children um, here. We have worked on ministry uh, with, to and with same gender families, and a number of those uh, um, 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 uh, recommendations have been implemented. We continue to work on that. We are trying to confront racism as this church. Um, uh, we have had three webcasts so far. Uh, we're getting a little bit better at them. I hope I don't look quite as terrified as I did in the first one. But really trying to have some kind of a conversation or start a conversation in this church about the realities of racism. I think many of us hoped that uh, we were beyond that in this country, but I think the events of the last two years make it clear that we are not. Um, we've considered and are considering the unification of the three rosters. We had a worship jubilee, for heaven's sakes, last summer. So we're, we're busy doing these things all the while, starting new congregations, renewing congregations, supporting our global church ministries and missionary personnel, sending hundreds of young adults in global mission, responding to disasters, domestic and foreign, resettling refugees, forming rostered leaders, advocacy in Washington at the UN, in state public policy offices, feeding the hungry, tending to ecumenical and interreligious relationships, all before lunch. <laughs> And this is work that we do together. I was happy to hear, I thought, I thought Secretary Berger had a stellar report yesterday. And I particularly liked the part when he said, we are all the ELCA. So this is work that we all do together, but we do it in different places. But how and why do we do this work is something also that I've been focusing on for the past three years. And it's getting, I think it's getting some traction because I've been in some synods where you could, you could chant my four emphases. We are church. We're Lutheran, church together, church for the sake of the world. Very good. Oh, thank you, Bishop Talmadge. It warms my heart. That's great. So I think it's important when we organize our work and when we're together that we understand that we are church first. Um, Annette Shoemaker, who is your, um, she's your director of the, the ELCA Foundation, likes to remind people we are not the American Cancer Society. 
We are not a non-governmental organization. We're not a business in, the sense, in that sense. Um, we are the church. And we need to be clear that our lives are formed by word and sacrament, that we gather as the beloved children of God around the means of grace, that our lives are hid in Christ. That's where we have our life, our identity, our peace, our strength. And then we're sent out to do all of the things that we're able to do. This is a very um, specifically, uniquely Lutheran way of understanding who we are. That in fact, the gospel word forms faith. And people need to hear in a variety of ways and experience in a variety of ways the living word of God through scripture, through the sacraments, through music, but especially through the incarnate Jesus Christ. We're not always so good at talking about that as Lutherans, not all of us, but there are great swaths of us who I've heard that we hold the name of the Lord in such reverence that we don't even speak it out loud. Well, how will people believe unless they hear? And what is that, can we take a look at our reticence about speaking about how our lives make sense because they are caught up in the life and death of, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think we need to take a look at that. We've heard from our, our vice presidential um, candidates here that in fact the world longs to hear the gospel. Well, they're not going to hear it if we just think about it. They need to hear it from us. And the notion that somehow if they just see how we live our lives and by our wonderful example, they'll be moved to ask us how and why are you doing these things, that's not going to work. How many people have come up to you in the last, oh golly, 10 years and said, gee, you're living this wonderful, marvelous life. Tell me about how that works. I don't think that that's going on. We have to be willing to say that. I found um, in some places, of course, we as Lutherans, deeply hold on to our relationship and trust in this relationship that God has forged with us through Jesus Christ and strengthens through the Holy Spirit. But um, we don't talk about it. It's almost as if Jesus has become wallpaper. That's not who we are as the church. So how can we somehow feel free and comfortable and joyful when talking about the joy of the gospel? We're also Lutheran which after yesterday's festivities might seem a little counterintuitive to hold this up as an emphasis. But I'm pretty clear that we can't form relationships with other denominations or other religions if we're not clear about who we are. And I still believe that Lutherans have a distinctive voice not only in ecumenical circles and interreligious circles, but also that's necessary in the public square. We talk about law and gospel. We say that we're saint and sinner. We understand that we're bound and free. So we live with that paradox. We see that the world can be both and, as David Swartling likes to say, as opposed to either or, which increasingly in the, in the narrative and in the discourse going on in our, in our society today, especially around some of the I don't know how you'd say it, craziness of our election cycles, that people want to sort everybody out into one or the other. And we say, that's not how it works. You can't do it that way. Now, what's our, what's our fight song? See if you get this one right. Mighty Fortress, there you go. Okay. Took you a little while to get there. Mighty Fortress, yes. Um, then what's our, what would be our chant? Justified by grace. Grace, okay, good, you got it, okay, good. Yeah. Well, that's not unique to us, exactly. That's not, we mean, long before, long before Luther or St. Paul or even Jesus, God demonstrated God's complete, um, um, generous grace to the people of Israel when he elected them. That's an important thing, yes. But we understand that, that, this, that, we are, that, that, that we as Lutherans tell the Jesus story in a particular way, based on grace. But the notion is not that somehow we're out there as wildly running around with unbridled freedom and we need to be sort of corralled and then uh, bound. The notion is that we are in bondage to sin and can't free ourselves if you have the LBW, 
or we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves if you're in the ELW, and that through, through the work of God in Jesus Christ, we have been set free, free from that, and now we're free to serve the neighbor. We also have a theology of the cross, which often I hear used by someone saying, you need to die. Have you heard that? You know, they, something needs to die, and they usually don't mean themselves. I don't believe that's what the th theology of the cross is talking about at all. I think it's talking about the reality that this is a sinful and broken world. And in the midst of the sin and brokenness to, to, to save us, redeem us, and reconcile us, that's where the cross had to stand. And we understand also from the theology of the cross that the cross not only puts to, to death the worst among us, the worst things among us, the most deadly things among us, the cross also puts to death our best intentions so that it is not we who are working, but Christ who is working through us. One thing I hope we're beginning to understand, particularly as we say, and by and large, over the church, when I've had discussions with people about the called forward together in Christ process, they say either we are or God is calling us to be a diverse, inclusive, multicultural church. Well, what does that look like? What does Lutheran look like? I never had Lefsa until I was 60 years old. And? If you put enough butter and sugar on anything, it's really good. <laughs> we did come over to, this, to the new world, or to this world. It wasn't new to uh, our Native Americans, it was their world. We came over to this land um, in, ethnic, in ethnic waves. And we stayed in our ethnic enclaves, which was fine for a while, because that protected us from being assimilated into the sort of um, Calvinist, deist culture that was around us, so we could still be able to participate. But now we have come to identify Lutheranism with a particular ethnic group, usually Northern and Central Europeans. We had a discussion at, at, at your churchwide office. We were talking about what it means to be Lutheran. And uh, so we, the, Marcus Coons was leading this, um, and uh, people were saying, oh, you know, jello and uh, green bean casserole, and I suppose it's tater tot hot dish in South Dakota. And one of your colleagues, who happens to be a colleague of color, said, that is not my experience at all, and I have been a Lutheran all my life. We have to be very, very careful that we don't divide, define ourselves by culture or by cuisine. There are more Lutherans of color throughout the world and throughout the Lutheran Federation than there are European descent Lutherans. Now, I don't want to, for a moment, discount the faithfulness of our European immigrant ancestors and the importance, I mean, clearly, um, that's part of my own heritage as well. Um, but when we get stuck in defining Lutherans in a sort of Garrison Keeler sort of way, we are automatically othering and excluding those who are equally Lutheran but have a different experience. How do we recognize and welcome the gifts that others bring, as opposed to seeing, this was maybe indelicate in the sermon on Monday, uh, that uh, people of color and language other than English are sort of, could sort of accessorize the ELCA to make us more multicultural. Those are gifts to be enjoyed and welcomed, not problems to be solved. So if it's not culture and cuisine that defines it, our theology must help us define what it is to be Lutheran and unify us. And to that end, I am calling this church to read the small catechism together from now until October 2017. We have a number of resources ready for you online with new voices is one, one of the toolkits we're getting out there and 1517 Media, Augsburg Fortress, I believe, has available for every one of you the small catechism. Yay. You know, sometimes I think just as youth is wasted on the young, so is catechism wasted on the young. <laughs> How much do you remember from your catechism? 
This is most certainly true. I've tested you all across the church. You know, in several sermons, it really impressed the Roman Catholic bishop in uh, eastern North Dakota at Terry Branston's installation where he said, can you begin to recite Luther's explanation to the third article of the Apostles' Creed? Huh? You didn't do as well as they did, I'll tell you. That's a treasure. And um, Luther, I mean, Beth Lewis was pretty charitable in the quote she chose from Luther about him assessing the, the spiritual and, and uh, um, theological acumen of his pastors and of his people. Basically, he was calling us ravening pigs and horrible, lazy cows. It's, he gets pretty, pretty blunt. Um, but that was meant so that people at home could study, that parents could help catechize their children. I mean, he was a little extreme to have the kids recite the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments before they got anything to eat. But it's something that we need to discover. It's a very concise, beautiful way of understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to be doing that. Now, if you want to keep reading it on November 1st of 2017, I also encourage that. But this is something, this is something that we have in common. Probably one of the most uh, familiar uh, phrases for Lutherans all over the world in hundreds of language is, this is most certainly true, or what does this mean? We will, you've seen, I think, some of the, the work that we've done with women leaders, international women leaders, and sometimes I've heard people say in this church, maybe we should drop off the Lutheran identification and just say we're Christians. And, you know, I've seen this in some contexts when people thought, particularly in the 80s, if we didn't call ourselves St. Paul Lutheran Church, but somehow renamed ourselves the Church at Pheasant Corners, you know, people would come running to church. It, it, didn't, it didn't work that way. But let me tell you, when um, uh, Pastor Waiveta Bullock and I were at the El Zadari refugee camp in Jordan, the Syrian refugees knew what Lutheran was. When people are in, 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 as they sometimes tell me, the godless West Coast, especially Washington, Oregon, when they go to social services, they just call it Lutheran. They know what Lutheran is. The women who come to these international women uh, seminars in Wittenberg, for them it is precious to be grounded in this tradition because they are a minority as Christians and often as Christians are a minority in a Muslim culture. They understand what it means to be Lutheran. We have had the privilege in this country not to have to think about it very much. So now, why can't we, we, this is one way for us to bind ourselves together. So that will be happening this year. We're going to read the small catechism together. And when I show up in your synods and your congregations, I think I might quiz you. And you can quiz me back. We are also church together. And this is not just a slogan, it's scripture. In baptism, not only has, have, have, uh, have, uh, has something changed, we've been changed. And in baptism, we are members one of another. There is no such thing as a solitary Christian, and there is no such thing as a private religion. We're in this together. You know, in this country, there's, uh, I think in some ways, the autonomy of the individual has been raised to the level of idolatry. That is not the Christian understanding. First of all, we don't exist apart from God. We have our lives hid in Christ. We are cared for, nourished, and supported by the Holy Spirit. So right there, there's a relationship. But also we understand that we are all members of the same body. Something that happens in South Dakota is going to affect our members down in the Caribbean. Something that happens in Alaska will have an effect on people in Hawaii. This is not just us doing things in separate places. And we are church together. Now, I've seen this happen. When people talk about church-wide, right? Mm -hmm. They get that face. Mm -hmm. Higgins Road. Have you seen it? Yeah. But I'll tell you, your bishops and their staffs also know when talk, people talk about the synod. <laughs> We're all in this together. And so if someone disparages the ELCA, you should take offense at that because they're talking about you.
I remember um, back in my former synod going to a particularly contentious church council meeting. I'm sure that doesn't happen in any other synods, and I know with uh, Bishop Allende that is never happening anymore in northeastern Ohio, but it happened when I was there. And finally, I just took a breath and looked at the church council and said, you know, I have a mother. <laughs> I'm a human being. I didn't say, and my mother's coming down here, you better get out of her way. <laughs> But your church-wide staff are also members of the body of Christ. They're your brothers and sisters in Christ. They had parents or still have parents. They are human beings. And they're right here. Look at these lovely people. Aren't they wonderful? Yes. I had the um, wonderful opportunity to be with um, uh, National President Susan Johnson at the um, Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada's, um, I, do you call them conventions, I, or conventions, yes, she said. And by golly, someone stood up and said, what do we get from the National Church? <laughs> I said, that's the wrong question. What do we get to do as church together? That's the question we should be asking and answering. And you've all heard the joke, and you can substitute whatever denomination or people you want in that, that, that a Lutheran goes to heaven and uh, gets there. No, no, it's not. We'll get, make it be an Episcopalian in honor of my husband. An Episcopalian goes to heaven, and he's looking around, and there at the river of life, all the Baptists are frolicking and splashing themselves. It's wonderful. Over in the corner, you see the Methodists having very orderly meetings together. You know, somewhere Baptists are singing hallelujah, and then there's this fortress built around someplace. And you know, a mighty fortress is coming, being sung, and then the Episcopalian says, well, who are they? And St. Peter says, shh, those are the ELCA Lutherans, and they don't think anyone else is here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, we don't quite get that bad, but in some cases, I think most of, many people in our congregations believe that that is the church entirely in that congregation. Even though, and I know in many places in this country, there's another Lutheran church maybe two miles down the road. They don't understand that they're part of a conference. Do you know that you have conferences in your synods? Well, that's encouraging. They don't always know that they're part of a synod or that is in part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. So we're trying to work on that concept. But it's not just the ELCA. We are part of the Lutheran World Federation, where we are church together with, with churches from all across the world, all across the world. And we're not just Lutheran. As you've seen yesterday, we have relationships with six full communion partners, and maybe after yesterday, there'll be another full communion partner in the not too distant future. <laughs> So we have relationships with all of it. It's, it's not just us. We are one expression or one part of the Lord's vineyard. But we are not doing this on our own or by ourselves. And we have also understood that God has created a marvelously diverse world. And there are many expressions and, of, of religious belief. And so we just can't somehow ignore that we live in an interreligious um, culture right now and that we need to work together, particularly at this time in this country when there's so much um, fear of the other, particularly of people of other uh, religious traditions. We're not, we, we are church together. Amparo was a wonderful example of what we can do better together than we can do apart. So let's keep up the work on that. And we are church for the sake of the world. Of course, we have this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Of course, we are gathered around word and sacrament. But some of the most important words that are spoken in a liturgy are, go in peace, serve the Lord. So we're sent out each worship time to be engaged in the world, understanding that we're nurtured by the sacraments and the word, but that we are called to serve this world and not to see people as problems to be solved. God sees this world and each person in it as fascinating and precious, and we should be doing the same thing. That's what informs our work. This year, our day of service, God's Work, Our Hands Sunday, falls on 
and it falls on the 15th anniversary of that tragic, wrenching day. We are paying particular attention to thanking first responders in the work that we do on, on uh, God's Work, Our Hands Sunday. And I wonder, have we any first responders in the hall today? Could you please stand? Thank you. 9-11 shook us, I think, many of us, to the foundations. We were sort of on island U.S., and we didn't think we could be hurt that way, but we were. What has happened since 9-11 has been both good and bad. The good is that in many ways we understood that well, golly, the terrorists seemed to think we were all Americans and didn't divide us into African Americans and European Americans and Latino Americans. They hated all of us equally. They saw us as one nation. And we were able in some ways to come together as one nation. But one of the bad things that came out of 9-11 was an increase in Islamophobism. Phob phobism. And then we heard from, um, from Dr. Saeed, and I've spoken with Muslim colleagues, that they are living in fear right now. I did have the chance to go to the Islamic Society of North America's um, convention in, uh, in uh, D Detroit, in uh, Southeast Michigan Synod. Bishop Chris was, was with me. And uh, it, one thing happened, I, just, I was almost near tears. They, first of all, their conventions are just like our church-wide assemblies, only they use prayer rugs instead of pews. It's just, it's the same thing. I think they're the same vendors in some cases. <laughs> but the way they start their assembly is a little bit different. So they start with, uh, they had a color guard, a little Boy Scout troop. You know how they are when they're little, little the ties are crooked and their pants are not right and whatever. So this little cute group of Boy Scouts, they must be nine or ten years old, they march in. And the guy who was in charge of it says, first of all, and this was hard for me to take, color guard, proudly post the colors of the great state of Michigan. Well, you know, being from Ohio, that was a little difficult. <laughs> but then he said, color guard, proudly post the colors of the United States of America. These are American citizens. They are us. They are our neighbors. And we are called, as we understand, to love the neighbor. That is part of our Christian tradition and our Lutheran tradition. We need to be, be intentional about that. Another thing. <laughs> One of the most poignant stories I heard about 9-11 is something that we can carry with us. Stephen Bowman, who is your uh, executive director for um, domestic mission, was bishop in um, Metro New York, where Bishop Rimbo now serves. And uh, he had a number of members who were uh, in first responders or chaplains, and there was one of his pastors who was a chaplain to the firefighters. And when he saw the first plane hit the first tower, he ran down to Lower Manhattan to get there, and there the firefighters were mustering and getting ready to run into the building. And the pastor was there and anointed each one with oil, with a cross on their foreheads, and then prayed with them. And then the firefighters ran into the building. The people who survived said they could see the crosses shining on the foreheads of the firefighters. In baptism, we have all been marked with the cross of Christ and are all called not to run away, but to run to those dark and deadly places, bringing the light and life of Christ. So I ask for a moment of prayer for all those who are lost on 9-11. Good and gracious God, by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the anointing of your Holy Spirit, you have made us a holy people and also a people who can give ourselves wholly to the world. 
Bless and keep all the families who lost members on that terrible day. Thank you for the service and witness of those who gave their lives. And may our continued witness be one of peace, one of justice, one of love, and never of retribution. You hold all of them in your hands. They are seated at their heavenly places now. May we be faithful to that day when we will join them and you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we still have work to do, a lot of work. And I don't just mean for the rest of the week because we're behind in the memorials stuff right now, but when we talk about church together, I think that's one of the toughest nuts to crack. That has always been difficult. I'm not the first one to talk about this. I remember a synod assembly probably 20 years ago where the whole synod staff wrote, this, you, we are the synod, the synod is us, you are the synod, and we're still working on this. So how do we understand that we're really in this together? Very often, uh, especially in our culture now, there's something which um, Rafael Malpica Padilla, who is your director for Global Mission, calls um, the hermeneutics of suspicion. And we're very quick to um, ascribe a motive to somebody else without having a conversation with them. That's when you get the church-wide thing going, the synod thing going on like that. We can't do that anymore. There aren't that many of us. Well, now we find out yesterday, there are more Muslims in these, this country than there are ELCA Lutherans. So we, we can't be working against each other anymore. We need to come together. That's a very, very important. We are going to help that happen. I think that reading the small catechism together and talking about it together would do that. But we're going to have for the first time in the history of this church a rostered leaders gathering uh, next summer in Atlanta, Georgia. And it's going to be August 7th through the 10th. You know, it's going to be like a youth gathering but for rostered leaders. Yeah. Only we'll probably need more supervision, I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's, that's something we can do to see ourselves as partners in this work together and not as somehow competitors for the same piece of the pie. We are church together. And in only those attitudes will only change. See, you're the stealth army now. You need to go out to your congregations and say, I've seen them and they're not that bad. <laughs> and tell about the work that we're doing here. That was a question that was asked at the press conference about, um, after the plenary about Declaration on the Way. How is this going to be any different than just another report? How will this new relationship and increased unity and understanding between Lutherans and Roman Catholics, how will they get to the pews? That's up to you. I can't be everywhere. And as marvelous and as tireless as your bishops are, they can't be everywhere. You have to do that, because you are the church, you are the ELCA. We are... We also need to reclaim the word evangelical. I remember um, in the 80s uh, when evangelical, that um, expression of Christian tradition was uh, um, associated with one particular group and a reporter came to our congregation which said Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and they said, well, what are evangelicals? And the senior pastor said, well, you know, we understand that, we, that God has given us the good news of Jesus Christ and, we, you know, we, and she said, oh no, you're the wrong ones and then off she went, so. So yes, that is what evangelion means in Greek. It's the good news. But also we have to reclaim an evangelical spirit. People aren't going to know unless we tell them. That's, that's not me. That's pretty much, I don't know, St. Paul, so, who himself was a proto-Lutheran, just, just putting that out there a little bit. <laughs> it's up to us. We've been given this great treasure, sure, in earthen vessels, but we need to be, have an evangelical spirit. People, what was the, youth, the former Lutheran understanding of um, evangelism? If they want us, they know where to find us. No, no. And there's so many other options on Sunday morning. I mean, gosh, you know, in 50, 60 years ago, you didn't have to worry about soccer on Sunday mornings. Of course, no one played soccer in this country then, but some people did, okay. 
So we're, we're, we, don't ex we don't exist or can claim this privileged spot in the society anymore. We are a missionary church once again. And I'm pretty clear the Roman Empire did not give Christians Sundays off. So this is what we've been given. It's not our fault the world has changed, but how do we change so that, that we can be, have encounters with people and invite them into this wonderful intimate relationship with God and Jesus Christ? We have to reclaim the word evangelical. We also have work to do on immigration reform in this country. It's There are more, there are more um, immigrants and displaced persons in the world now than in any time since World War II. One of the things that we've done is the Amparo strategy. We are working with Syrian refugees to resettle them. And yes, they're vetted. I don't care what you hear on the news. They're vetted. I probably would not pass the test to get into this country compared to what they go through. We are working with our partners, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services, to settle immigrants, especially as we, and then the Syrian immigrants as they come over here, and to make them, welcome them so they become a part of our fabric of our country. But let me tell you, when, when uh, uh, Dr. Bullock and I were in the Zadari um, refugee camp, they didn't want to come here. They didn't want to be in Jordan, they just wanted to go home. So it's not that people or these unaccompanied migrant children are saying, oh, you know, their parents, in North America, great babysitting, childcare option. They want to go home, but they can't because their homes are devastated or it's too dangerous for them to be there. And as I said on, on Monday, I was stunned how quickly we forgot the image of that little toddler's body on the beach in the Mediterranean after the Paris attacks. That's going to keep happening, but we have to keep our focus these are children of God, they're human beings. And let me tell you some of the benefits of immigrants. My grandparents on my mother's side came over on the boat, not that I'm the benefit, but I, I benefited from that. And we, we've, we, we've seen, we've seen um, when we've settled um, the lost boys of Sudan, two of those lost boys are now ELCA pastors. Wal Reet and Maween Arik. Wal went from South Sudan to Minnesota. Talk about climate change. <laughs> he walked past one of our churches and heard singing. He loves music. He came in and they said, sure, you can join our choir practice. He joined the choir. He joined the church. He entered our theological education and emerging ministries uh, program. He was ordained. Maween had a similar path to ordination, and they said, we want to go back now, and as we as the ELCA work with the Episcopal Church and found a new Lutheran church in the newest country in the world, Wall is newer, Our Maween is Dinka. Those are the groups that are killing each other even now, still, in Sudan and South Sudan. And they wanted to go back and say, we're founding this church specifically as Nuer and Dinka to show that in Christ we are all one. That is what immigrants can do. And we have a lot of work to do on racial justice or the lack of it in this country. We've had some conversations. There's wonderful, we were trying to put on the web, I think Jocelyn's been busy putting up um, videos of what's happening in many of our synods across the church, in many of our congregations and communities. Why can't we be the ones to lead that effort? Why couldn't we do that? It's, it's gonna be a hard conversation, people, because this is a deep and intractable problem. But in, with God, all things are possible. But if we believe that in baptism, we have been joined to the death and resurrection of Christ, and we've already experienced the only death that really matters, and that as Jesus said, no one can snatch us from his hand, then we can ha stand in there and have those difficult con conversations because we're not gonna die from it. And we can begin to form these relationships. Now, one thing that gets in the way, and I remember I bristled at this, is the notion of white privilege. Oh, I resented that. That stung when I first hear about white privilege. I mean, I worked hard. And then I read a book, I think it was called The Color of Money, with, which your director for racial justice, Judith Roberts, had given me. And it talked about the way things are baked into our um, political uh, system and into our economic system that favors some of us 
over others. And then I remembered this. My father, like thousands in his generation, enlisted during World War II. My dad flew B-24s. My dad was a brave man. He very rarely talked about real combat experiences, but he was a brave man. And when he came back to this country after the war, he had the benefit of the GI Bill. But you know who were the escorts for the B-24s? I, I don't know if it was my father's uh, squadron. It was the Tuskegee Airmen. It was the Red Tails. So these men were flying, giving their lives, risking their lives for this country, protecting my father, but when they came back to this country, one of the benefits of the GI Bill was a low interest loan. My dad and mom could buy their first home. If you were African American, you were not eligible for the same benefit. That is white privilege. We didn't create it, we inherited it. But now that we know that it exists and our eyes are open, we are complicit if we don't do something to change laws and attitudes so that there is a level playing field in this country. And so there is liberty and justice for all. We can be a force for good. And to my European American brothers and sisters, this is a conversation we have to have amongst ourselves and to be honest about this. But we can't do it alone or in isolation. We deeply need all of our brothers and sisters of color for us to understand what it, life is like in this country. And then we need to commit ourselves to do something about it. So please, would you go back to your congregations? And this is a tough one. And right now, if this is being live streamed, and you can quote this and tweet this out, pastors, when you start to get pushback from your congregations, just blame it on me. And your bishops, pastors, will give you support and cover as best as they can. But most importantly, you folks who are members of congregations, when you see in your own congregation that when people are trying to work for racial justice and understanding and the pastor starts to catch heck for it, you need to stand up and say, no, that is not who we are as a people. Now, I know it's possible for a Lutheran church to do this on a national scale. And a shout out to my sister, Bishop Susan Johnson. Their church has taken racial justice, particularly um, in terms of rights of indigenous and First Nations people, very seriously. Bishop Johnson, even though the Lutheran church was not a part of the system of residential schools run by churches on behalf of the government of Canada, which took um, First Nations, Native American people, children from their homes into these residential schools and literally beat out of them any sense of being from that culture. And in fact, we have found out over 70 years sexually abused these children even though the Lutheran Church wasn't part of that, Susan Johnson was a part of the truth and reconciliation process in Canada and went to every single one of those hearings and stood up for that. And that has made a difference in Canada. 70% of the people in Canada said, yes, this was racial and cultural genocide that we perpetrated on Native Americans. The church can do this. And let me tell you something else. And Canada's taken in way more Syrian refugees than we are. When the Syrian refugees, first shipment of them came over, flew over, the Canadian government had a welcome, literally a welcome banner out at the airport. We can learn from the Canadians. Thank you, Susan. But we can't do everything all the time, everywhere. 
And that's what the called forward together in Christ process has been about. Now, all of your bishops knew about this. When did we start talking about this? Last March, April? Pardon me? Last year. I, it all runs together. Here's the funny thing. A complete aside, and I, I'm taking some license. When I was in the parish, I knew what day it was every single day. It was a, you know, Wednesday was catechism. Thursday was choir practice. Sunday was church. Monday, you figure out. What, and then I went to the synod office, and my brother and sister bishops can attest to this. You lose that regular rhythm, right? And then you have to plan so far in advance, you don't even know what, what time of year it is, what season of the year you're in. And then they're in hotel rooms all the time, so they usually don't know where they are. Well, that's why I couldn't remember when we did this. I, I don't know what season or time of year is. And one time it was so bad. So when you see my husband, you get to thank him. That I was um, at a church-wide assembly and came back and was home. But I, when I woke up, I was convinced I was in my hotel room. And I looked over and there was a man in my bed and I screamed. <laughs> And dear Conrad said, yeah, welcome home, honey. It's uh, really good. So we've known about this. We've been having these conversations across the church. How many of you had this conversation called forward in your synod assemblies this year? Oh, my. I, I went to five. I know that happened at least four. So come on. You, you don't, maybe you weren't at your synod assembly. I'm not sure. So. We've had this conversation with the Conference of Bishops, with the Church Council, um, with our networks, um, with youth and young adults, with our ethnic um, uh, associations. Um, we've had this online across the church, and we're going we're gonna to sort of, we brought together then the results or, of, of these conversations of what you have said you believe God is calling us toward. Because we're going to have to figure out what these priorities are and then emphasize, though, when we might have to let some things go. It might be the thing you like the best, but we're going to try to do this together. On Saturday, we're going to take a look at the, the Future Directions paper, which is a synthesis of all of our thinking across the church. And if you haven't had a chance to do this, you can go to www.elca forward slash future, and you can look at what we've all been doing. And you could take this back to your congregations. That was another question someone said. How will this get down to the congregations? And I said, how many of you are members of ELCA congregations? How many of you are? Yeah, go home and tell people about this process. So we'll take a look at that together on Saturday to see if we've gotten this right. It's kind of like an MSP, a ministry site profile for the entire church. And we've said some pretty bold things some of which I think are aspirational, pretty, pretty bold things, like we believe God is calling us to be an inclusive, multicultural, diverse church. We're not, we're not quite there yet. But we'll take a look at that, talk about that, bring that back, and then this will be, once we see if we've gotten that profile right, that will be distributed across the church. And now that you know about it, you better watch for it. And if it's not showing up in your parish, you know, I was a parish pastor. My desk is where a lot of stuff went to die because there's so many things going on all the time. But you could pick it up. You could do this. And this is not just some top-down thing we've done. This has been an extensive conversation across the church. And it's not something that's being foisted on you by churchwide. Nor do I believe in the conversations I've had with people who were very hopeful, and I mostly said, sorry, clergy, pastors be quiet so the lay people have a chance to speak in these small groups. I heard that. That this is what you have said is important. And I saw hopefulness and not a sense that this is just some sort of survival strategy to keep an institution going. There is hope in this church that God is not finished with us yet and may have a use for the ELCA. And it's out of this hope that we dare to take some of these steps. But we're going to have to hold ourselves accountable, each other accountable. There is no legislated accountability in this church for anyone other than the churchwide staff. And you know this in your congregation. Someone can show up or not on Sunday. Someone can be a part of, the, of, of work and plan. Someone can contribute to the, mission, the ministry of your congregation or not. No one holds them accountable. Congregations can decide whether or not they're going to participate in the work of the synod. I know that there might be some synod someplace where you have congregations who have not shown up at a synod assembly meeting in decades. Do any of us call that congregation and say, hey, we missed you. 
show up next time. We don't. We don't hold each other accountable. Pastors can opt in to say, I'm on board with what, what, what the Synod is doing because I'm a part of that and what the church is doing together. No, we can opt in or opt out. Uh, synods face the pressure of trying to work in their territories and at the same time looking at what's coming for the entire church. It's hard. Bishop Dick Graham of Metro New York said this profound, profound, true thing one time. He was part of the LIFT um, task force, living in the, into the future together. And they took a look at how our church was put together. And there, I think we still haven't worked it out. And he said it was clear that when the church came together, we trusted the Holy Spirit and no one else. And that, that was not the intention when we put together the Constitution. But I think that that's true. We tend to be a pixelated church. But it's time for us to say, when a parishioner doesn't show up, don't wait for the pastor to call that person. Say, we missed you in church on Sunday. Can you be there? Okay? And then if someone doesn't, a congregation or a pastor in your, in your text study or in your conference, if that pastor has been become a lone ranger, you get on the phone and say to her, we need you and we miss you. Don't wait for the bishop to do that. You do that. And then synods, you know, we have to come together. We have to hold each other accountable. It's something we are working together on in the Conference of Bishops. Our governance does not ensure that, but our unity in Christ makes it possible. That's work we have to do. So, dear church, thank you for these past three years. They're less terrifying now. Thank you for the work that you do in your congregations and communities, your synods, your regions all across this church. Thanks to our church-wide staff, who really are your allies in all this. Thanks to my brother and sister bishops, who really do serve courageously, tirelessly, and with a sense of humor across this church. And I also thank my dear husband who, as he said when he was in Pittsburgh, he didn't even get a vote. <laughs> <laughs> but he's been a great support for all of this. We have work to do. God will give us the energy and the courage and the will to do it. Let's go church. Thank you. Thank you.